My name is Andrew Caroli, right there. I'm at Cornell University, uh, professor of finance there. And um, I, uh, I have, uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, this is my 25th FMA. Uh, so I'm very proud. I came in when I was a second year, first year, first year faculty member. Uh, way back in the day, so it's always an honor and a pleasure to come back. Uh, the organization has been very, very good to me, uh, and I hope you are maximizing uh, here as well. There's lots of seats in the front. People are afraid of me, uh, I guess. Um, John Graham, who is the program chair, uh, asked me to do a special session. He says, don't you have a new book on emerging markets? Uh, would you be willing to talk about that book during a special session? And I said, no. Uh, I will not talk about the book uh, because I did that two years ago. And you can watch the videotape and YouTube clip of me presenting that book. Um, he says, well, why don't you, you're an editor of a journal. Why don't you talk about the editing business or talk, to, talk about something to do with publishing papers that might help young scholars? And I said, well, no, I've done that too. Uh, I think it was a year, three years ago, we did a special session called Editors on the Hot Seat, where we had young people, mostly young people in the audience, peppering editors, me and a couple of other people on this. Perhaps some of you were there. Um, so he said, well, why don't you do something <laughs> related to those things? And I said, well, okay. What I thought was I could talk about the challenges of doing research on a subject matter that is very, very close to my heart. It's something I care about very deeply. I think about this challenge as a editor. I clearly have been thinking about it as a scholar, as a writer, as a professor, a researcher for 20 years. So um, what I thought I would do is share with you some of that to help you do better in this dimension. Now, this only is interesting to you if you have a modest, at least a modest interest in doing research in emerging markets. Is this, uh, is this fair? Is this fair that most people in this room are already past that line? Uh, yes. Okay, so, so hopefully that's good. Uh, so here's what I've got. I've got 90 minutes. Um, I've broken it into two main parts. The first part, I'm going to mostly have my hands on the steering wheel and kind of guide you into my logic. The last third, I want to, this to be interactive. And I want you to think about what we've been talking about. Feel free to talk about your own research and have me react. Maybe we'll have our colleagues react um, and talk about the challenges that you're facing. Um, if it's a paper that I currently am handling, as the editor of the RFS, you can understand if I recuse myself from that conversation, and you can talk amongst yourselves, and I'll watch. Uh, but but uh, but otherwise, uh, otherwise, fair game for the back third. For the first two thirds, it's going to be mostly me. Come on up front. There's plenty of seats up here. Um, come on up. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about this question: What's hot? in emerging markets research. And I've broken that into three parts, OK? Um, the first part is going to be what I call the challenge. The fact is, uh, well, I'll share with you the fact right out of the gate. There is an enormous dearth of research in our top journals on the subject of emerging markets, notwithstanding the interest that is here. Come on up front. There's lots of seats. Please don't be shy. Uh, so that's going to be, and I'm going to document this. I'm actually going to empirically document the dearth of this research in a way that perhaps you haven't seen. And maybe you guys, given that you're already interested actively, you, are, you already know this. There's going to be at least one fact in there that I think you don't know. Second, I'm going to talk about a framework. And this is where I am going to talk about my book. This is the book. It's called Cracking the Emerging Markets in Enigma. It's published by Oxford University Press, who is over there. They're, they've got copies of them, of the book. And it's published under the, I'm very proud to say, 
the Financial Management Association Survey and Synthesis Series that is published by Oxford University Press. And it just came out less than a year ago, a little over a year ago, a little over a year ago. And I'm going to use this not to talk about the book, which I will, but to lay out for you a framework around which you can build a successful research program on emerging markets. And then the back third of that first session, I'm actually going to dare to talk about recent research, working papers and recently published and forthcoming papers that I consider right tales. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to help me to think about why it is those papers have become successful. They're focused on emerging markets, why they're successful, how they fit into this framework that should be a guiding light for you, okay? And why, why they're successful mostly. That's, that's what, so you're, we're going to interact there as well. And then again, the back third is free for all Q&A, okay? Please come on up, feel free to come on up. There's seats up here and here. Don't be, don't be hesitant, okay? Now, unfortunately, I don't have a clicker. Is everybody clear on what we're going to do? So me for um, uh, another 54 minutes, and then Q&A. But even then, please do not hesitate to put up your hand, stop me, pause me uh, along the way, OK? So here we go. So the first part is called the challenge. This should work. I believe this should work. OK? All right. Uh, the cha defining the challenge, okay? Sorry, I have to, I guess the clicker's not working, so. A dearth of emerging markets research. Here is an empirical, please come on up, come on up here, there's empty seats all the way up here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that among 9,000 published papers in the top 16 journals in finance over the last 25 years, of those empirical papers published in those journals, 16% of them focus on non-US markets. That means 84% of them focus on US markets. Probably 85%, 90% of the 84% are spinning CRISP and CompuStat. It's very telling about our world, isn't it? Uh, I, are, I would like to argue that this fraction is well below the economic importance of non-US markets. I, I've coined a phrase for this. I call it the academic home bias. You guys are doing international research, so you know about the home bias phenomenon when it comes to investor holdings. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if the home is the US, there is a striking home bias in the academ academia. There's seats here and up here. Please. Feel free to come on up. Um, 9,233, I'm going to show you some numbers here and some graphs. No most in, a couple of interesting salient facts here. There is no noteworthy trend that this is being redressed, notwithstanding some of the efforts that some of us are making uh, to change things. But I want to also point out to you something else. In the world of the home bias phenomenon in investing, there's also something called the foreign bias. You guys are nodding your heads, you know this. Conditional on what investors allocate outside of their country of domicile, there is also an interesting skewing of the holdings of investors among non-domestic markets in which they invest. Some markets they disproportionately overinvest in, overweight, some markets, conditional on being outside as they deploy their monies outside, there is also an interesting skewing in terms of underweighting among those other markets that they, they invest in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as there is an academic home bias, there is also a very interesting academic foreign bias. And I'm going to show you some interesting skewing of this data over the last 20 years in terms of which countries uh, are featured. One Critical empirical fact here is among all those non-US countries that are skewed in terms of their representation, one of the skews, I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff in that data, let me tell you, but one of the skews is that emerging markets are disproportionately underrepresented relative to their economic importance in turn. And 
there are many ways, of course, to measure the economic importance of these markets, right? All right, so here's a picture. I'm going to have to go over here, Jackie. I'm sorry, Jacqueline, I'm sorry. Um, All right. So this is, this is a paper that I happen to have written. It was based on a keynote address I gave a couple years ago. It's called Home Bias and Academic Puzzle. Uh, the, our friends at the Review of Finance published it this year. I don't know which issue it came out in. It's a few months ago. And it documents these empirical facts. It's called academic, I call it the academic home bias. And here is, here is a picture of the data. This is a measure of the fraction of papers that are published on US markets. Come on up here. Fraction of papers that are published on US markets. And what I've done is documented here one of the benchmarks that are used. In, in the investment home bias literature, we typically use the cap weighted world market portfolio as the natural benchmark, as if that's right. So what I did was, at least in this figure, use the cap weighting of the US as a benchmark. And you remember, it's 84% no nominal weighting of the US in research, and the US represents about 45% of the cap. So this represents the underweighting of non-US markets, or the relative overweighting, if you want, of US markets in research. This is in the top four journals, blue, year by year, going up through 2011. The red is the top 14 journals. And you can see that the, the dimension of the underweighting is smaller, which means that the non-top four journals, RFS, JF, JFE, uh, JFQA, the balance of them are picking up some of the emerging or non-US research that the top four are not. And then uh, I include three more journals, Pacific Basin Finance Journal, Journal of International Money and Finance, that are hardwired to focus on international research. And you can see that that remedies, remedies the deficiency among the top 17 journals uh, to a large extent. Do you see a trend here? It's tempting. It's tempting to say that it's getting better. Um, maybe even here you're tempted. Um, I choose to interpret this as a disappointingly flat trend. Uh, but that's my prerogative, since I got the data, I assembled the data, and I'm allowed to interpret it the way I want to. So. But you can challenge the question. Here is a, uh, here's a picture. So take all those 16% non-US papers. This is in the top four journals. Take the 16% of the non-US papers, and then have a look at which countries are featured. Now, there's two kinds of international papers. You guys know this. But one is what we call pan-international. So if you've read any of the work I've written or others have written, there's typically many countries featured, you know, 30, 40 countries featured because you're doing some sort of broad-based asset pricing type of paper. Take those off the table. So of the 16%, let's call that, I don't know, a third of them. Take those off the table. The two-thirds of the 16% are then looking at specific countries or sets of countries. So what we did with my army of RAs is we identified the specific country of context among those that are sort of clinically focused on certain kinds of markets or regions. And I profiled them here. This is also, of course, cap weighted. So we're looking at the fraction of papers that are published on, say, Sweden, minus the fraction of the non-US market cap world that Sweden represents as the benchmark. Again, it's not the only benchmark I use in this study. You can check all the others. What do you see here? There's some positives and some negatives and some very large positives, like, for example, Sweden and Canada. My friends from Canada hate it when I show them <laughs> that Canadian research is disproportionately overweight in terms of the representation in the top terms. My friends from China, who feel that a lot of research in China is underrepresented in the top journals. In fact, when you take the US overweight off the table, China actually empirically is about 2% overweight in terms of the relative fraction. There are some countries like Italy that are massively underweight. France, Switzerland. So
So what to do? So here's, so what we can do is now analyze different attributes of these over and underweights. And imagine regressing these overweights and underweights, and these are available in a panel setting by year. You could run sort of a giant panel regression against stuff. The stuff that you might choose to do is uh, the level of financial development, right? That would be one proxy for it. Here's, here's what that data looks like. There's a scatter plot. You can see it's a positive slope. Countries that are underdeveloped, countries that are overdeveloped, more developed, okay? And this is sort of a generic uh, index here. And you can see that there are some outliers relative to even this. Uh, the R squared is okay. Um, and what, of course, what we're trying to document is the fact, represent here is the fact that disproportionately, and these are raw weights, by the way, over here, disproportionately emerging markets are underweight relative to uh, more developed markets. There are outliers all over the place, right? Italy is over here that goes against the grain, but for the most part, emerging market research is underweight. <laughs> so you're tempted to be very, very discouraged about the unconditional probabilities of publishing research on emerging markets. But here's an interesting, dirty little secret. This is not specifically about emerging markets. So the other thing that my army of research assistants did is they collected data on cumulative average annual citation counts by cohort year according to when the papers were published. And we separated the papers into those that are focused on the US and those that are focused on non-US markets. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you the red is the cumulative average annual citation count. These are organized by cohort year according to the year of publication. And you can see that the red, the red or orange bar, which is non-US, typically is higher. Not always, not every year, but on average, it's typically higher than the cumulative citation count associated with papers that are focused on US markets. I have not controlled for anything else that's salient and material to driving citation counts. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Uh, probably I should be thinking about that, but I didn't do that except just report the raw statistics. So ladies and gentlemen, what did we learn? The challenge. The unconditional odds of publishing non-US research, and particularly research on emerging markets, are high. They're, they're, they're stacked against you. Okay? They're stacked against you, number, number one and number two. But number three, there may be some material rewards for the scholar who is able to successfully deploy their research into those fora because the marketplace seems to pick up on that kind of research. I don't know if it's specially now or not, but uh, there is evidence that there is a reward for the unconditional risks associated with doing this research. Okay? Okay, how am I doing? Uh, keep going. Okay? So, how does this work? Why would, if it's true what you just said, why and how would this, how would these papers be relatively more successful? So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about what I call my framework in the book. So it's kind of like a digression for about 20 minutes about this book and what, what the framework is that I built here. I did not write this book for you guys. This is not a textbook. People use it as, as a textbook, uh, at least at a dozen universities, to the best of my knowledge. And you're absolutely welcome to do it. It boosts sales. But I did not write this for you. I wrote this book, as I'll show you in a second, as a compendium, a 250-page compendium that helps to sort of sort and organize the collective research that's out there on emerging markets to guide people in industry. This is a trade publication to guide people in industry to help them think about what emerging markets are, the, the most salient attributes of emerging markets. And I'm also purposefully trying to dissuade them from thinking about it the wrong way, to refocus them on thinking about it the right way. And I'll tell you what I mean in a second. Okay? So uh, there's the book, Oxford University Press. There is a website that goes with it, emergingmarketsenigma.com. It's got all the data. This is a very data intensive, I'm an empiricist, you probably could guess that. 
from the stuff I just showed you about the history of research on this. Uh, there's a lot of, the, all the data that's in this book is available for download uh, in the, on the website, so you're welcome. So it's a rigorous, comprehensive, and practical framework for measuring what I call the fundamental risks of investing in emerging markets. It's rigorous because it's you guys, it's us. It's the academy commenting, it's basically me synthesizing the collective wisdom of the academy. So it's based on sound academic research. Comprehensive in the sense that this framework is actually going to delineate what I call my six dimensions. All right? I've heard, actually heard somebody in the media call it the Crowley Six Dimension. That makes me so pleased. <laughs> and so make, it warms the cockles of my heart uh, to hear that. But it's six dimensions. I don't think they're going to surprise you. I don't think they're going to surprise you. And there's some arbitrariness in the designing of the six, but hopefully you'll see what I did and it makes some sense. And it focuses these six dimensions on what I call the uneven quality of institutions that assure the integrity of markets. Because that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I believe, since I've been working in this area, that's what I believe really defines emerging markets. So much of what you read out there in the media and among active investors in this space is it's all about the up, 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 growth, 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 the growth paths. That's not what defines emerging markets. What defines emerging markets is the fragility of the institutions that lie, underlie the, the, the markets. And then, of course, with data, I develop a scoring system that actually dares to rank countries on these six dimensions, each differently and together. And I'll show you some of that data. The data is all built around 57 countries, 33 traditionally defined, and 24 developed. It's all publicly available data sources. I'll show you some taste of that. And then in the back third of the book, I take it and project it and try to cross-validate it, looking at the investor, actually investor holdings, the home bias and the foreign bias phenomenon. That's my outlet valve at the end of the book. I won't show you any of that. And now the data is newly available in a panel framework all the way through 14. So if you happen to be interested in any of this uh, for your own research, you're welcome to get it. So. Why did I write it? Because I think you've already sensed it. I want to raise the bar on the quality of the discourse and discussion that's out there about emerging markets, which I think is too low. I mean, I'm talking about out there in industry because they're focused on the wrong things. There's lots of seats up here, guys. Come on up. Come on up. If you're prepared to commit, come on up to the front. <laughs> We're still, nobody's left yet, so I guess that's a, that's a reasonable sign that we're making progress here. Okay, good, okay. Um, so the first thing that I do, and I did this on purpose, the first sentence of the first page of the book, in the first chapter, defines what I call emerging markets, okay? And I call them underfunded growth opportunities with problems. They're underfunded because they don't have a pool of capital to fund the growth opportunities that are embedded in there, and that's what the story is. Of course, you can remedy an underfunded problem by sourcing, sourcing funding from outside. And that's all fine and good as the world is becoming more and more integrated. But the problem is, well, the problem is there are problems that are keeping that capital that would be funding those projects at bay. What problems? Chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. My six dimensions, OK? Um, why bother? I've already told you about this. Uh, stop talking about the acronyms, they make me sick. Uh, emphasize, surely it's not just a simple conversation. Well, do you think Greece is no longer a developed country? Surely Korea is not emerging anymore. That conversation is so boring to me. It's so fundamentally boring because what we, as sophisticated scholars, we know there's much more that lies beyond whether Morgan Stanley Capital International uh, or the World Bank declares you above the line or below the line. There are so many dimensions that separate these countries. Stop with these boring, meaningless acronyms, because we're more sophisticated than that. And then try to stop these commercial index vendors, I have not named them, I just did actually, uh, uh, from <laughs> defining for us as scholars, for heaven's sakes, why are they telling us whether a country is emerging or developed? Why are we listening to them? We're more sophisticated than that. So I challenge you to do better. Uh, what are my six dimensions? I'll just push them up here. Um, uh, uh, there's, it's supposed to be a giant reveal here, but uh, there are six dimensions. They are, I think, what you would logically expect. The first among equals, I call my market capacity constraints. Many emerging markets simply are underfunded. 
Their capital, capital pools are thin, they're not deep enough, they're not broad enough, and they're not uh, strong enough to sustain the potential, the economic potential of the country. And that's really what defines them. If you talk to many people out there in industry and you ask them, what is the criteria by which you would judge, or one of these index vendors, what is the criteria by which you would judge a country to be developed or emerging? This, they pick one of these. GDP per capita, market cap to GDP, something along those lines. These are all in here. They have to be here. But we know there's much more than that. First of all, what is interesting that defines these guys is inefficiencies. The fact is that even if the markets are deep enough and they are attractive enough, they may impede our, uh, as foreign investors, we may be impeded by the fact that there is these frictions. The plumbing is bad, right? And that keeps us at bay. And so this measure that I build focuses on brokerage commissions, transfer taxes, market impact costs, a lot of market microstructure research is featured in here, but also things like settlement, clearance and settlement systems, the integrity of clearance and settlement systems. There's wonderful data out there that scholars fail to exploit, looking at the integrity of these things, this, the risk management practices that are in place for uh, depository trust company and equivalent in many of these countries and their registries, um, foreign investability restrictions, registration rules, ownership restrictions, currency convertibility limits, withholding taxes, the existence of double taxation treaties, all sorts of things. There's about 16 different metrics that flow into that bucket. I call these first things the hard constraints in emerging markets because they're tangible. They're easily, relatively easily measurable. You can go get data. The softer ones are these last three chapters, seven, eight, and nine, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the heart of the book. And these are the ones that we spend a lot of time. Look at the program for the FMA 2016 and see how many papers are focused on these questions. In fact, your papers are focused on these questions. Corporate opacity, which is the governance, transparency and governance stuff. This is about governance rankings using those commercially generated data on, trends, on, on governance, accounting standards, block holder control, ownership structure, board composition, things along those lines feature in here. Law and finance literature, prominently featured in chapter eight, limits on legal protections, creditor rights, any director rights, any self-dealing, you know about all these things. Those are all measured in here. And then finally, this one which people talk about, but boy, oh boy, it's so hard to pin reliably down a measures of political instability or political risk. Uh, we have a number of ways to do that. We can talk about those. That's what's featured in here. And there's a lot of World Bank data in here. So there's my six. You have to remember these because I'm going to be testing you guys <laughs> when it comes to the prominent research that I'm going to feature here. So um, how do I build them? Very, very off-the-shelf statistical techniques that we all know and have learned about. Basically, I'm taking existing publicly available data that spans these countries over time, and I'm compressing them using principal component analysis. And it's all hands above the table. There are some ugly tables in this book that I insisted vis-a-vis -vis the publisher to have in there so that everything that I did was hands above the table. There's nothing proprietary about this. There's a huge appendix that documents all the sourcing of the data and all the estimates from the principal component analysis, can you believe it, are in that book for, for industry people. Not for you guys, you know how to do this. But for industry people, I want them to see that there's nothing secretive, all hands above the table. So here's a sample of some of the data. There's world payment systems, trading cost data, a working paper the authors gave me permission for, some stuff of my own, what the heck, uh, data from various journals looking at ownership structure and governance, corporate transparency. I'm using everything and anything that I know. I'm taking my advantage as somebody who's been reading this research for 25 years and I'm just harvesting. Harvesting and deploying. Um, for the greater good. Nothing should be inaccessible for any, anybody else to rebuild and copy. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to build these tables that feature these countries and these metrics, these respective metrics that are drawn from these various studies. Right? And then I'm going to use PCA and I'm going to compress and standardize a score on a normal scale from minus two and a half to plus two and a half standardized scale. There's still a few seats here if you want to if you want to dare to come all the way up to the front, um, you're welcome to it. And thank you all for coming.
Here's an example of the, one of the tables from the PCA output. This happens to be for my corporate opacity or governance indicator. Here are the metrics that go into it. I shamelessly use some of my own papers. I do know them. But I use a lot of other people's papers as well. And other raw data, like uh, you know, uh, world scopes, closely held shares. Or uh, Utpal I just ran into in the hallway looking at earnings aggressiveness. They built an index on earnings aggressiveness. I'm not, I'm not ashamed, I'm, I'm proud to use all of our collective wisdom to dis deploy into these measures. Why not? Why not? Uh, I've got some original data on governance scores from MSCI. Uh, I, you know, why not? Um, and here are some of the weights that are deployed into the PCA. This happens to be for this particular one. As you know, these are not pure weights because it's orthonormalized scores on these, these coefficients, right? So it's the sum of the squared weights that add up to one. So that uh, there are funny things. But the signs actually kind of mean something too, right? So if you have a high earnings management score, you get a negative weight. If you have relatively higher CFAR uh, accounting standards, you get a positive weight. So when I create my standardized score, watch for it. Positive score is good, negative score is bad. Positive score is good, negative score is bad. Cor a corporate opacity, these are better governed countries in terms of corporate governance, negative score is bad, okay? Remember that. And that's the way I do it for each of the six buckets. How do they look? Well, here's the one that you'll see in the first chapter. And this is the median representation for the de traditionally classified developed markets and the traditionally classified emerging markets. 24 of these. 33 of these, and you can see the relative scores. This is a spider diagram. They emanate from the middle outward, negative scores in the middle, bad, positive scores outside, good, okay? And you can see that the typical, what do you see? There's a couple of things you see here that's kind of interesting. The typical developed country has relatively more positive, less negative, more positive scores than the typical emerging country. The emer typical emerging country lies within this. Second thing you notice, huh, it's not, it's not a perfect hexagon. The distinctions on these markets relative to each other is uneven across these six dimensions. It shows, proves to me, and I hope to the audience, the readers, that these dimensions should be treated differently. It's not about being above the line or below the line unconditionally. It's that some countries are relatively stronger on some dimensions and not so much on other dimensions. And that's interesting. And that's interesting. Like, for example, the difference between emerging and developed countries in terms of this law and finance, notwithstanding all the LLSV literature from the late 90s, is actually relatively a small margin of difference compared to, for example, the differences in terms of operational efficiencies with the ways in which we, scholars, have measured these things. Okay. And of course, the cool thing is you can run this by country, like Brazil versus, this is as of 2012. I'm just showcasing this. I don't know, Jacqueline, if you can see any of these pictures. They're all on the web. All 57 countries are on the web, web for 2012, right now. And I'm planning to figure out how to get this all deployed up there. And then what you can see here is every country is different. They have their own shape. And they're hardly pure hexagons. There are some countries that really fall down on the job, Russia, in terms of corporate governance. China also gets a relatively bad score on corporate governance. That, from our perspective, makes it interesting. That's an interesting challenge and an opportunity. That's the way you should hear it. If I talk to government officials, they get angry and they want to throw tomatoes at me. And I just tell them, it's the data, not me, not my opinion. Data, hands above the table, OK? And so you can do all these things. And of course, they're changing. So here's a, here's a picture. I think I'm going to show you Argentina. All right? And I'm going to do a dynamic here. Watch this. So that's a picture of Argentina as of 2000. And here's how it changes and evolves over time. Right? This is interesting, how they're dynamically changing. Certainly from a political standpoint, they've definitely evolved. Uh, but even in terms of foreign accessibility and some of the treatment, hostile treatment that foreign investors have received in Argentina, right, over the last five, six years has become very, very interesting. Their scores have compressed into the negative range. Here's a ranking overall of, of unconditional across all scores. I show you this only to show you names, 
because they're interesting. I hate the averaging part across the six buckets, the six dimensions. Um, so what I like to show you is the relative ranks preserved unconditionally and show you how different those are. You know, they're correlated. These measures are correlated with each other, but not perfectly correlated. So if you're bad in terms of foreign accessibility, you're probably bad in terms of political instability, but not necessarily in a perfectly correlated way. So. And finally, in the back third of the book, I actually do a cross-validation exercise. And I've been doing a bunch of these talks in industry with the book. That was the purpose, right? <laughs> um, and then I've been getting lots of questions, and so I've been doing a lot of supplemental experiments as well. But my idea for the book that's featured is to cross-validate these scores, who cares, um, against de facto institutional investor holdings around the world and to look at the home bias and specifically the foreign bias that I described off the top. And what I did was I used this fact set lion's shares database. It's great if you've never used it before. Uh, relatively few scholars are still using it, uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and it's about 23.6 trillion as of 2012 deployed. 6.3 trillion of the 23.6 trillion, wherever these institutions are located, are being deployed outside their country of domicile. So this is the foreign part of the foreign bias. And then what I do is for each of these countries, one at a time, I evaluate their excess holdings in each of the countries in which they invest relative to their relative market caps to gauge whether there's over systematic overweights and underweights. I can look country by country. Heck, I can look institution by institution. So if I go and do a customized presentation in-house for a particular institutional investor, and they're available inside lion shares, I can pluck them out and project their over and unders and show them. But the most interesting thing is then to project these over and unders against these risk measures, these measures of instability, to see just how binding they appear to be de facto on choices that investors are making. And the answer in the book is, not bad. That's the way I sell it. Publisher says, I greatly undersell. I say, I'm a financial economist. <laughs> so I say, not bad. You know? uh, there's a bonus chapter that looks at dis uh, unusual flows that took place during 2013. While we were announcing the end of the taper experiment, there were a lot of disruptive flows in emerging markets. I used those indicators to see which countries were disproportionately treated. And the answer is, they work, it works pretty well. And then more recently, I've been asked by a number of different institutional investors to focus on some of the recent flow disruptions in 14 and 15 and some of the unconditional volatility. It's not in the book, um, but if you're interested, I can send you some of those results. It's kind of interesting. There's reasonable forecast power across country in terms of which have shown themselves to be relatively more volatile. I didn't talk about all this to impress you. But what I'm trying to do is establish for you a guiding light, a framework around which to think about how you might take your research when it comes to looking at emerging markets. Think about how your research fits into the six dimensional framework and where you can have a comparative advantage. So if you accept these, here's my challenge to you now, as I'm about to roll out, um, roll out the next part of this segment. Um, is if you accept these six dimensions of institutional fragility actually do characterize emerging markets, let's say you do, and those are reasonable representations, okay, then we should be able to use them as a guide on which institutional features we should proactively be showcasing when it comes to doing research in a particular country that we're interested in, in the emerging market space, or sets of countries, okay? And of course, our ultimate objective, if you want to publish in the very best journals, is to answer questions using that unique institutional setting to answer fundamental questions that financial economists, not just us in this room who work on emerging markets, right? For those who people who came in after the start, I asked whether people are genuinely interested in emerging markets research before they walked into this room. So I assumed that that was the case. That's why I'm saying we, okay? Uh, so it's about answering fundamental questions and then using and exploiting these unique institutional features of this framework to guide you. So I am asking you, 
when you think about your paper, or any paper, what is your unique, your special hook that brings us to the table? What is the fundamental question that you're answering? Which dimension in the EM framework, the sixth dimensional framework, is featured that will compel the general reader, not the one who's already sold on emerging markets, but the general reader who is interested in deep fundamental questions of financial economics to bring them to your attention or bring you to their attention, okay? So I'm challenging you to do that, okay? Now the riskiest part of the presentation, okay? I'm going to dare to showcase, I have nine examples <coughs> of research. Now, it's challenging for me because several of the authors that are featured in these papers are in the audience, okay? So they're gonna hold their tongues <laughs> or they'll be outed because we already know who they are. I'm not saying, well, I am saying, these are right tail papers. So I'm gonna challenge you and I'm gonna ask you to put up your hand to help me think through. I'm gonna tell you what the paper did. I obviously am showing you that I liked it. This paper influenced me. I thought it was good, okay? And then between when whoever puts up their hand, thinking about that framework, thinking about my challenge to you towards answering a deep fundamental question, I want you and I to brainstorm out why that paper might be successful on those dimensions, okay? I'm not sanctioning these. Yes, I am at the Review of Financial Studies. I'm affiliated with the Review of Financial Studies. There are some papers featured here that are associated with the Review of Financial Studies, but there are papers that are specifically not. Some are actually in working paper form. That's very dangerous for me to do that. Um, so, but there it is, okay? You ready? So here's one. Okay. This is published in the Journal of Financial Economics a couple of years ago. Um, this caught my attention as a working paper and then I tracked it and it influenced me greatly as a published paper. It's called When the Cats Away, the Mice Will Play, Does Regulation at Home Affect Bank Risk, risk Taking at, uh, Abroad? Um, on Hannah Popoff Liddell. And in every one of these I'm going to show you not only where it's published, if not, or if not, and I'm going to do a little map of the region that is being showcased in here. And this is Central and Eastern Europe that is being showcased in this paper. Okay, so here's, here's, the, um, here's the abstract and here's the context. So what we've got here, and every paper, as you know, every paper has a showcase table or graph. And I'm gonna showcase, I'm gonna, I cherry picked, I didn't ask the author's permission. I cherry picked the paid table, the most salient relevant table uh, to showcase here. So this paper is looking at 155 banks from around the world, I believe, um, targeting 9,600 firms in um, 16 countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And what we're interested in looking at here is the extent to which the barriers to entry for banks in those countries are relevant to their lending practices or their lending activity in those target markets. But we're, uh, and we're interested in two special wrinkles here. Number one, we're gonna characterize these firms, and it turns out you can because the way they do so is they're drawing on a special pan Central Eastern European survey of both public and private firms that have received or not received uh, credit from banks. And what they are doing is they flag them in an interesting way, they call them opaque, non-opaque, according to whether or not they have audited financial statements, okay? And what we're interested in is the extent to which banks that are domiciled in turn in a country with relatively intense regulations that guide them, capital stringency, right? Capital adequacy, stringency requirements, and or restrictions on the types of activities that they can get into. Whether that affects their lending practices, are they disproportionately more likely to take risks by lending to relatively weaker borrowers in those target markets? Are they taking advantage of the fact that they can get away from the cat at home that is imposing tough laws on them and go play as mice in this region where they've been allowed in and lend 
in heroically riskier ways than they would have been able to do otherwise. Make sense? Cool question, right? Cool question. And the answer is, the answer is, this is their table five, their signature table five. The answer is yes, if there are, so on the left hand side, you've got a dummy variable as to whether or not the firm is credit constrained or not, okay? Uh, that's whether they reported in that survey that they actually got denied credit or not. And over here, they have variables, a bunch of control variables that I'm not showing you, and some country level variables that say, if you have high barriers to entry, you're less likely to be denied. And furthermore, um, they are looking at the impact of regulatory restrictions on the banks, the lending banks from where they come. They themselves don't matter unless Unless, let's look at this one, unless you're a relatively opaque firm. If you're a weaker borrower, you are disproportionately more, less likely to be financially constrained, which means that you're less likely to be denied because these German banks are coming into Hungary and they're more likely to lend to the inframarginal borrower. And that's what they're showing here. So what's the, what's the big hook here? Who's going to volunteer? Can't be the author who's sitting in our midst. What's the hook? Volunteer. I sold it. I sold it myself. Anybody? I'm going to break the ice. Somebody break the ice. So I'm supposed to wait, Jacqueline, right? <clears throat> no volunteers? Come on. What's the hook? What's, okay, let me ask the easier question. Which is the dimension? that is featured here in a special way according to the rubric or framework, the six bucket framework. Which one? Number two, Number two which was about market capacity. Uh, no, that's about operational inefficiencies. Okay, that's possible. It's possible. Um, which one do you think? Corporate opacity. Because of the, the good and the bad? Well, I see the opaque up there. The opaque, the good and the bad yeah. uh, borrowers. Yeah. For sure, right? That's their dimension. They could have used maybe if they had data, some other dimensions on which to separate them. But I think there's one other one of those six that rises above the top. It's the, the, the uh, accessibility stuff. Yeah, that's really the story, right? These are, these are borrowers that would not otherwise be exposed to foreign banks. They only, they're only exposed to the extent they allow them in. And then the next... Interesting question, the hook of the paper, which I would love to invite you to say, is what, what, is, what are we learning here? So we've got this unique attribute that these were otherwise blocking entry heretofore, now they've opened up, now the foreign banks are coming in, and we're looking at how their regulations at home affect their choices, cool, right? We wouldn't have been able to if they were blocking them at the gate, but what's the, what's the hook? What are we learning about? What's the big question that, that the reason why the JFE published this probably in the, in the heads of the reviewers? <coughs> now we're warmed up here, come on. Provision against FDIs? Yeah, it's just sort of, sort of the drivers of FDI, but there's one particular driver in the, in, the, sorry, in the bank space that's really interesting in terms of cross-border flows that people have looked at. Should we let the author say? Seems like a courtesy. What's the hook? Well, I would say it's Greg, regulatory arbitrage. It's regulatory arbitrage. It's the fact that people are really interested in the, the patchwork quilt of regulations around the world and how that drives these flows. Again, until they opened up the markets, we wouldn't know. But it's about regulatory arbitrage. Regulatory arbitrage is a big issue. Policy dimensions of that issue are huge. And just the, the got, how much regulation, the difference in regulations affect economic choices is one that we've been desperately creative and wanting to study, right, Greg? And we continue to. What a great study. So there's Greg right there. So you could send, send him your, your uh, well, you can, you know, you can think what you like. I like the paper a lot, and it's influenced me a great deal. So now we got the idea, okay? Number two, working paper. Alan, Chan, to you. Entrusted loans. A close look at China's shadow banking system. Um, by the way, if for every one of these cases, Greg can attest to the fact that I contacted each of these sets of authors 
to sort of ask their, sort of but not really ask their permission to showcase their papers. I just wanted to make sure that if I had an audience of more than 20 people and they went out of this room and said, Caroli was saying all sorts of things about their paper, and they were going to go say, well, what did he say? What did he say? So I'm going to share with them the slides, and I've alerted them to the fact that I'm talking about their papers as a courtesy, OK? So don't think I'm doing anything behind their backs or out there. Plus, it's on video. It's on video, too. I'm, I'm sunk. Um, so it's about China. It's a work. Uh, they just sent me, uh, when I told them this, they sent me their September 16 version of this. Shadow banking. Okay, so let me show you what this is about. These are, these things, these entrusted loans are really interesting. Okay, it's a kind of form of shadow banking where banks, I guess two papers on banking so far. Huh? Uh, these, these banks, uh, they're not banks that are lending. It's basically one corporate to another corporate that's lending using a bank as a financial intermediary who's just a facilitator for a fee, okay? So it's sort of almost like direct to direct. What's really cool about entrusted loans, particularly within the context of China, is that a, 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 about a third of these go to what are called affiliated firms. Firms that are up and down the supply chain or either their parents or subs. And the question, of course, the logical question you ask is, how are they pricing those loans? Are they pricing them differently if they're affiliated or unaffiliated? There's a flag in the data in China for these entrusted loans as to whether or not they're affiliated or not. And it turns out the answer is, yeah, it matters. So they look at the subsequent outcomes of these loans, whether they become delinquent or extended or fail, and they look at whether you can connect that to the pricing right, as if it could have been anticipated. And what they show you is that the pricing is differential according to whether or not um, there was a subsequent outcome. That is, if it's an unaffiliated loan, non-affiliated loan, the adjusted interest rate in the contract is more likely to predict the subsequent likelihood of an extension of the loan or whether it becomes overdue or delinquent. And you see if it's an affiliated loan, the pricing is based on some other criteria. It's not based on the ultimate ex, ex post riskiness. It's based on some other criteria. How interesting is this? What's the hook? What's the dimension? Why would this capture somebody's fancy? Hands? Somebody hands up? So self dealing dimension, law and finance. Certainly there's some of that in here, isn't there? So there's the corporate opacity, the self dealing uh, dimension that's definitely featured in here. Anything else? You can sell me on. There's no right answer on this dimension. Obviously, and, and this is not published, but I'm admitting to finding it compelling myself, right? I found this compelling. That's why I'm showcasing it. And obviously, I'm thinking about my framework. So definitely, that one is in here, right? Please. Things in general avoidance of the legal system because if they're affiliated firms, you don't need to ever recourse to outside institutions. That's fair. So there's some touch to that. Although I don't think there's anything explicit about testing the vibrancy of the legal system here in China with respect to the likelihood of these things being delinquent. At least I don't think there is in that. And I don't think any of the authors are in the room. Um, please. Uh, no, I'm one of the authors. You are! <laughs> hey! See? <laughs> see? And you knew I was doing this, right? Yeah. Okay. So you can't answer this question. You cannot answer this question. What's another dimension that of the six dimensions, if you remember them? Well, pass, uh, so political instability, legal protections, corporate opacity, for foreign accessibility, operational efficiencies, and capacity constraints. Those are my six. Please. Are about the market capacity constraints? Me too. Me too. So how are you thinking about it? That's right. What's happening in the shadow banking world is that these non-banks are supplementing the banks that might, in a country like China, be otherwise constrained in their ability to foster credit, credit expansion. And they're clearly doing it in a relatively under-regulated market. And that is creating a larger capacity for trade transactions that would otherwise be. So it, somehow that's the one that bubbles to the top for me, is it's about, this is a really, studying the shadow banking sector in China is a really interesting way to showcase the market capacity constraints, the test of market capacity constraints. It's a workaround that companies are doing. How are we doing? We still have about 36 minutes, and I have uh, eight more. I promise you Q&A, 
Um, should I keep going with the, the next few? It's kind of a, it's like a test, isn't it? It's like a test, right? Um, and like I said, I cherry pick these. Let's see, what did I pick next? Ah, this one's forthcoming. This one's forthcoming. So I obviously am partial to this. I edited this one. Ayagari Demergutskund Maximovich, India. And it's called What Determines Entrepreneurial Outcomes in Emerging Markets, The Role of Initial Conditions. So let me tell you what they do. And I think I'll show you one picture. So here's their abstract. So um, what they do is they look at, through this special statistical office data from uh, at the national level in India, they look at private and public firms in India, scattered all over all, all states in India. And they look at and track uh, key outcomes, like the size of these firms from their date of birth for up to eight years following. Who has data like that? Right? And we're talking about thousands and thousands of firms, small and large, wide ranging. And what, of course, we know is that there are many different attributes to these states across India according to what, how they foster the development of these entrepreneurial outcomes, these firms being birthed in the first place and how they grow and evolve uh, out, of the, out of the gate, right? Um, and what they document uh, as their key finding. I'm sorry, it's being cut off at the side there. If people want a copy of the slides, I'm more than happy to send them uh, afterwards. I have nothing to, uh, and they'll be available uh, on the site here as well. Um, what we document here, you're gonna see a couple of pictures, is that it's, uh, it's remarkable how little an influence there is whether or not the state is wealthy or poor or has better uh, legal systems in place to protect uh, investors in these companies. The role of institutions in terms of the initial stages are remarkably unimportant, which is fascinating that it flies in the face of a lot of the learnings that we have come to uh, see. So, there, so it must be, and there's this big literature, uh, I'm giving away the hook, there's this whole literature in the entrepreneurial finance world about things that are more deeply endemic to a firm as things that affect their trajectory beyond nature versus nurture, right? It's less about the environment, the institutional environment that supports the firms in this case, as opposed to something deeper to do with the management team or their business plan or something deeper. So let me show you a couple of pictures. So I think I've shown you the hook. I've, I've answered the hook. Um, here's a picture. Oh, that's too hard. Sorry, too hard to see. So this is good bit. So these are large firms from zero to eight years, small firms from zero to eight years. And what we're now doing is within the class of large versus small, you can see there's a big wedge between them. And they sustain and never, they never diminish the, the gap, right? It's, it's there and it stays there and grows and expands. And here is the green is where you see poor business environment. Orange is where large firms conditional on um, good business environment. Poor, good. And in fact, goes the wrong way. And here, the environment really matters trivially for the small guys. They're small out of the gate. They stay small. They never become large on average. And whether they have a good environment or a bad environment doesn't seem to matter. So there's your experimental. Uh, here's the same thing. This is a rich state, poor state. That's according to the uh, regulatory environment that guides businesses. Why is this? What, what, what dimension is this showcasing? This is big debate in entrepreneurial finance. Wonderful setting of India. What's the what's the what's the dimension that's being featured? Anybody? Yeah. So there's yeah. The politics are probably different by state. Certainly, the, I think the law and finance story is here. I think this is about uh, limit, legal protections, but it's obviously much bigger than that. It could be several of those institutional dimensions. It could be governance. It could be business environment. It could be operational efficiencies, but it also could be the legal environment. Uh, frankly, it could be any one of those three that fits the bill uh, because they, they look at a smattering of these as well. But the fundamental question that grabs us is, golly, if we... If, India furnishes this wonderful data that gives us a chance to answer this question that's been burning 
in the backs of the minds of these people that are doing entrepreneurial finance. And here you can answer that in a really interesting setting with a very, very broad uh, cross-section of firms. Okay, this is another one forthcoming. Sorry, that's a double whammy there. Um, Fang, Lerner, and Ryu. Anybody here from the team? Nobody's here, okay. Uh, so intellectual property rights, protection, ownership, and innovation, evidence from China. This is newly forthcoming. Um, so here's what they do. So what they're doing is they've got, um, they're, of course, as you know, China gets a pretty bad rap when it comes to intellectual property rights, when it comes to comparisons around the world. Uh, here's a nice little cartoon that uh, uh, is kind of cheeky. I guess this is China over here. No, this is China over here. The Westerner is pointing at intellectual property rights and saying, look, you've got a worm in your apple. Ha, ha, ha. Very angry, but lots of worms and lots of apples everywhere on Earth, right? Uh, so that, I think that's from China Daily. I stole that from the China Daily. Um, so uh, they look at what's really interesting here is that the intellectual property rights protection laws across the 30 plus provinces in China are very different. Probably a number of my friends from the, from the mainland are, are aware of this. And of course, that's a really interesting dimension to this experiment. And, and, um, and what they show is that the rate and pace of innovation, they've got data from the patent office or the equivalent of the patent office in China. And they're looking at the rate and pace of patenting and citations of patents in different firms across the different provinces and show you that the quality of the regulations that protect, even within kind of within country across provinces are very, very different. There's some staggering as well with respect to this uh, that they, I think, showcase. But the other cool element of this is, of course, uh, maybe I should stop. Okay, I'll just tell you the fact, and then you guys can help me figure out why this is cool, is they also separate out types of firm by whether they're private, truly private firms versus state, former state-owned enterprises. And they show you that the rate and pace of innovativeness subject to being in a province with better in intellectual property rights is that much better for private firms than for an otherwise equivalent state-owned enterprise. What's the hook? Why are we interested in this? Legal protections. For sure, from a fundamental standpoint, legal protections for sure. And then add, add something to it. What else? Yeah, I guess that's right, because it's implied that there's an affiliation between the state-owned enterprises and otherwise a favorable treatment. You would imply that the governments would give you favorable treatment and protections for, the, you know, for your patents and the potential benefits from that. Um, and that's why you see this wedge coming through. That's exactly right. So would you, would, would you class? Now, here's a weird, weird thing about the book. The corruption stuff I throw into the political instability. <laughs> what? It's a sorry. No, no sorry. No, it's, it's, it's one of the quirks of the book is you have to decide as the writer of a book where you want to feature a particular thing. I happen to have stuck corruption into political instability. But here it's more about proximity to the government, right? In a country where the government is a strong presence. And that might be featured probably in the corporate governance, corporate opacity uh, dimension. That's probably what's capturing people's fancy here. So uh, it could be a couple of those things, but it's really picking on those, right? Keep going. Okay. <coughs> Still nobody left. It's a good sign. Jung Sub Lee, Ho Jong Shin, Hyung Yun. Hyung's right over there. Okay. And and Ho Jong, right? No, 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 no. no. I'm joking. Just Hyung. Hyung. <laughs> We're talking about Korea. Okay? And we're talking about family businesses. And family businesses, succession tournaments and risk taking in family firms. So here goes the paper. Where are you? Oh. Oh, I jumped ahead. So here's the paper. So what they're looking at is a bunch of these chai balls in Korea that are family dominated. And they're looking at succession planning. And they're looking at the fact that whether or not the nature, the unique nature, and they delve into the details of why we have these unique cultural forces or institutional forces that guide this type of succession planning in these chai bowls, family driven, uh, family uh, run chai bowls, that there exist these inherent tournaments among competing sons, there's gender issues that feature into this, sons that are pretenders to the top job, 
And what they show you is that in those tribals that are family run, where there's a larger set of contending sons that are running divisions of the company, there is inherently greater likelihood of risk taking in the overall firm than otherwise. And um, a mitigating force is whether there are large numbers of daughters that are featured, and particularly if the daughters are, through the marriage market, acquiring son-in-law assets <laughs> that might challenge the incumbent sons who are in this tournament, ascending to the, potentially to the top job, whether that's a countervailing force on the risk taking, and the answer is that yes. Yes, it is. And there's some nice, uh, nice IV type of experiments in the back third of the paper. What, what are we featuring here? What's the hook? Definitely there's cultural aspects. My book is, notwithstanding my interest in this subject, 100% silent on culture. I'm embarrassed to say. 100% silent. It's not in any of the six dimensions. And I don't even know how to, maybe if I'm writing the book again, I, I have something about that stuff. But they're clearly talking about unique cultural dimensions here. It's clearly more, among the six that are there though, which one would you say it leans on? Take a guess. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's, it's got to be the governance stuff, right? There's unique aspects to governance in terms of family dominated, family controlled, large conglomerates like, uh, like Lot and Hyundai and uh, High Tai and these guys. These are the ones that are featured in the paper, right? These five? Okay, I picked the right ones. Um, I should give the author a chance to. Do you want to say anything? Or? Sure. You're welcome to not, but. Platforms are supposed to profit maximize, and here they do something that is different from that. Um, Pop, quite tough. Because it's not size, but market momentum kind of That's thing. right. <laughs> it's not our conventional things, right? Right. But it's the, the, the focus is on risk taking, excessive risk taking, and these cultural aspects and mixed in with the government stuff. Andrew, so. just yeah, me. Please, that Jack that Jack. mitigation. You're not is, allowed to speak. You're a, you're a videographer. Okay, today I can't speak. Okay. okay. It, it's similar to the nonprofit, some of the nonprofit literature that shows that co-CEOs mitigate right. problems, governance problems. Right. So you've because got there, you've got the leader of the opposition watching right. the, yeah. the the prime minister yeah. in the, the equivalent. Yeah. yeah. Large dominant block holders mm -hmm. are the countervailing weight. It's like the sons-in-laws are the yeah. countervailing yes. weight uh, on the uh, the sons. So here's one. This is oh, this is uh, forthcoming as well. Uh, no, this is published. Lundquist and Chan. I don't think Wenlan's here. I don't think I'm pretty sure Alexander's not. Um, and what they're looking at is constraints to limits to arbitrage. Evidence from a recent financial innovation. What is this recent financial innovation? So about China, mostly. And what they do is they talk about these new kinds of activist investors who are capital constrained. They have very limited capital. So they actually cannot effect aggressive short selling actions against a target firm that they are bearish on for one reason or another. And what they do is they, this financial innovation is them shouting the badness of the company to the world, exploiting their websites and showcasing an open letter to the chairman or the CEO of the said targeted company. And for what purpose? Even though they're capital constrained, <coughs> the purpose is for this activist investor to basically shout enough negative noise about the company to induce the large scale long onlys to reduce and sell down their position. So this is a new form of activism that's being featured. And what kind, what kind, anybody want to name me a company that is subject to this? And one of the per perpetrators? One of these activist investors, any names? Samsung. Samsung is not, well, maybe now, right as we speak, right? <laughs> Could be right now. Uh, do you know of any one firm that's doing that? Is Ackman going after Samsung? No, not Samsung. Okay. But Ackman would certainly be in there. Yeah. Herbalife, exactly right. And uh, the, one that, the one that they like to talk about is Muddy Waters. Carson Block at Muddy Waters is featured here. But there's Cintron, uh, Carisdale Capital, and here are the companies that they went after. Cytoforce, of course, got huge headlines two years ago, two and a half years ago, three years ago now, 
uh, basically drove them, uh, drove them out. And it was not because these guys actually were running money. They were just writing open letters and questioning accounting practices at these various firms and calling them out, all towards jigging a sell down by the long haul lease, the new financial innovation. What are we featuring here? What's the hook? Why is this compel? Why does this compel the general reader who's not interested in emerging markets and Chinese companies per se? Well, that's a big question, right? About limits to arbitrage and these activist investors in general. So to that extent, this is kind of interesting. Which dimension? Which of the six? It's not really about capital constraints. It's not about operational inefficiencies. It could be partly have to do with foreign accessibility, but it's really a governance story again, right? It's, it's explicitly challenging the governance, integrity of the governance of the firm. Uh, let's see. I've still got some time here. Here's one. Uh, you know, you can see the partiality I have here. Um, <laughs> Central Europe again. Uh, my family's from Central Europe. Uh, no, I meant the partiality with respect to the journal. But, uh, and it's also a Cornell guy. It's like a triple whammy partiality here. It's terrible. I was not the editor on this one, obviously. Uh, Maurizio and Murillo have this paper looking at uh, contracting. And what they did was they basically, well, here it is. Here's the abstract. They basically are looking at um, a bunch of Eastern European countries that had engaged in recent reforms with respect to the pledging of certain kinds of collateral for lending loans and specifically with respect to what they call movable versus immovable objects. It used to be that they were precluded from using movable assets like machinery or equipment or tractors as pledgeable assets to justify lending or borrowing. Uh, uh, and they had to use you know, plants and property and fix things. Um, and the regulations basically opened this up. All of this was towards liberalizing these previous former communist countries uh, and, um, and what they show is that different firms were differentially treated by these regulatory reforms in terms of expanding the collateral space uh, that uh, is pledgeable by these firms. And they identified these firms according to the industries and the types of firms to the extent they could that are likely to have more movable assets in place, ex ante. And they show you that the wedge between those that are disproportionately more likely to need to lean on movable assets versus immovable um, are greatly expanding their leverage subsequent to the reform. So it's a classic diff and diff type of experiment, and it looks something like this. Uh, that's where the experiment, it's almost like 3.6% per year for overall tangibility, movable, non-movable. And I think there's a picture here. This is the wedge between the two. And here's the year relative to the collateral reform. I think this is the one in Romania. This is the specific one in Romania. So you can see this is a tremendous impact on leverage, differentially widely increasing their leverage ratios. Question? What's the compelling question? Greg? I want to say two things. Well, yeah. To me, the compelling question is the legal environment. It's the legal environment. But Thinking about the fact that you found very little difference between developed and undeveloped, I have a comment about that, and I think okay. that's because certainly not the, these guys. No, but you're in your in those uh, spider charts. Yes, on legal. On yeah. legal, and so one of the reasons uh, with respect to this dimension is there are a lot of advanced companies, the countries that have very primitive laws on movable assets. Japan just passed a law. Uh, about nine years ago. Pledgeability of movables. Exactly, right. And yeah. Europe, uh, the France, for so, instance, has passed some recent laws. So you're affirming that odd, it's a weird thing that the differences between developed and traditionally developed and traditionally emerging are, are so similar, they're, they're, they're so close there, and you're affirming that here. Um, very good. These guys only feature, I think, about 16, 17 countries like you do in your paper uh, in Eastern and Central Europe that did all this. And they were compelled to do it. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff that lies behind this, but this is certainly one. All right, let's see. I think I have one more. Uh, one more. This is called Yo Zhang and Zhang. It's a working paper called Who Captures the Power of the Pen? Authors in here? Always want to check, right? Uh, so it's about China again. Uh, and this one uh, is, I think, very cool. Uh, it's looking at, well, you can I already see the compelling 
right, the dimension that's featured in here. Um, and the compelling question is obviously about the media, the role of media, right? The media is either a caterer, right? They want to sell, sell newspapers and magazines, so they cater to the companies and they're in cahoots with them. Or they're actually a watchdog. And that's been a long-standing debate uh, with respect to media and finance and corporate finance uh, for a long period of time. Well, here's a cool thing about China. A large fraction of the, China, the Chinese media are actually government controlled. A large half is private, another half is private. What these guys do is they go through almost 60,000 news stories tracking companies and differentiate between types of media according to whether it's government controlled or not. And they look for different kind of corporate governance outcomes. Like for example, is, there, is the firm uh, subject to bad news, the firm, is the firm more likely to fire the chief, one of the officers, the chief, chief executive officer following bad performance if the news is disproportionately being tracked by the private news media as opposed to the government control. So, big compelling question about the media, right, and what role it plays, specifically, again, a government story. So I, I can't even hide that one. And here are some of the examples of the media. Those are the government guys and the private guys. I think I have that right. Do I have that right? These are the private ones. Everybody in China seems to know which ones are which. There's no, there's no secrets about this. First Financial Daily versus Securities Daily, China Securities Journal. Oh, one more, one last one. Um, Beckert, Harvey, Lundblad, Siegel, political risk spreads. I think this is the last one. Um, and these guys basically are looking at a large number of emerging markets, and they're looking at sovereign spreads. As you know, uh, one of, again, one of the big challenges is trying to think about political risk and tangibly measure it. So I'm going to call that an, the overriding compelling question that guides here. Um, and what they do is they actually use different metrics of political risk, some commercial, all commercial actually, and they try to decompose using a regression methodology the fraction of the sovereign yield spreads at the country level that can be explained by the uh, uh, by the, the quality of the uh, politi political environment using like the International Country Risk Guide, ICRG. It's a popular one. These guys use it a lot in their work. And what they document is that when you decompose the sovereign yield spread into this subcomponent that is related to political risk, it turns out that that has better predictive power for uh, foreign direct investment not going into that country than just using the raw MB, Emerging Markets Bond Index Spread itself. So extracting it draws out better information. So I've told you the compelling issue uh, is, is about measuring political risk, and this is clearly all about political risk methodology. I'll just skip this. This is their metrics and their way of doing it, and there's some nice pictures and some regressions. So. Uh, we still have about 13 minutes, less than I had hoped uh, for open questions. What am I trying to help you guys think about? is if you're going to do emerging market research, clearly there's a challenge. Clearly it's a challenge. But there's a way to meet that challenge. And the way to meet that challenge is to think about the hook, the fundamental question in financial economics that you're after. And think about, secondly, that's not enough. I mean, that's good, but that's not enough. The necessary and sufficient condition, I believe, for success is identifying the fundamental question that you want to pursue and showcase that is a burning question for all general readers out there, but exploit that unique dimension, that institutional feature of this market. And here's a framework to help you think about which ones of those you want to showcase. It may be a couple of them. It may be one of them. It's probably better to be one of them, right, than multiples of them. Questions, questions. Back and forth. Let's go back and forth for a little while together, for about 30 minutes. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I find this six dimensions very. Really I just start touching the subject. Great. I don't know too much about it, but from a person who usually studies some of the new mm -hmm. stuff, um, the additional challenge here is that, and typically any referee or critic would say, is that why. Why do we, in general, have to all listen to your story? Yeah. Or why can't you have done it 
in the, the US, in the US. The of people are interested in. Yeah. And then it, it comes down to everybody in this room. What, what is it that's fundamental that I can better address that's right. here? Yes. Than that's what I want. That's what I want. What is it here? What dimension is it here that can help me better answer that burning question that's per pervading out there than anybody else? And everybody in this room that's written on this subject matter, you're, yours truly included, has heard this counterpunch from the reviewers and or the editors. Tell me what's, what's the compelling thing? What is it? Well, here are the six dimensions. It's right? like in my that paper, but um, for example, an example, and I was a good example. For example, why do you solve the papers in, in your journal? Um, study Korean, this chatbot, okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Kind of front, and why is it good? So some one example is that we want to learn in general about divisions, how like Stein or Shasta yeah, Stein conglomerates, operate. yeah. The problem with that is that publicly available data is very limited because we do not see the relationship within division because it's not in the disclosure requirement. Right, right. Very fortunately, some of the countries in the business groups actually separately own companies. So you actually do get to see the ownership holdings yep. in between them. And yep. then you can see some of the skin in the game featuring out and all this. So there you have a very- Let's get in there, right? Understand divisions because you have uh, accessibility of data for you. Thank you. But, but that sort of it's, it's in general very difficult to find, I guess, the compelling reason why that particular emerging market feature is. Well, if it were it's easy, relevant. we'd all be doing it all the time, and we'd be populating the journal space with all, yeah. all of these great papers. But it's obviously not easy, right? Anybody else react? Yes, please. Uh, a similar discourse on the frontier markets. I was wondering what you think about that. Good question. I've been asked that a lot when I go and take this book on the road. Uh, what do I do about frontier markets? So in this newest data collection that took place with another army of RA this summer. I actually tried to build it out. The problem is data availability to be able to fill this out. So people have challenged me, can you retrofit some of these indices and scores for partial data on some of these uh, frontier markets? And, but it belies the big question. That says, so people, see the problem is you're in this room. You've already self-selected to be interested in this. So you're already predisposed to be studying frontier markets beyond just emerging markets. And the big question is the people outside this room are going to be asking, so tell me what it is that I can uniquely learn in the frontier space that I can't learn about in the emerging space. It's probably something. It's got to be something, right? You know that investors are actively engaged in studying frontier markets. The money is starting to flow. Yeah. So there must be that the scholars have to follow. Right? The scholars have to follow. That's what we do. Uh, but what is it? What is it? What dimension of uh, frontier markets? Of which part of the world? There are seriously understudied parts of the world. Let me tell you, Africa, Central Asia. Huge understudy. Geographically speaking. Yeah, I actually want to go back to this part when you showed us uh, the citation distribution. Yes. Right? And the Do you believe it? Do you believe it? I believe it, okay. but that, that's kind of my comment <laughs> okay. because um, you kind of present it as a nice trade-off on the plus I side. I would actually see it in a different way because for me it's yet additional uh, argument to say that as if, if we assume that citation is a proxy for the quality of the paper, so then what this graph tells me that to publish an emerging market, your paper has to be like 50% yeah. better. So yeah. as if there are two sets of criteria being yeah. imposed. Uh, so I, I would, and I'm working on emerging markets exclusively. And so for me, this graph would be bad news. That's bad news. Uh, so so because you're, it's you're imposed to yeah. higher standards yeah. of just, you yeah. know, like this entry barrier is much higher. Did you guys hear what she said? So yeah. she yeah. already says the table is tilted against the typical scholar like this. And now if you want to do emerging markets research, it's like, good luck, right? <laughs> it's like kind of for Asian students getting in the you know, top schools, right? As if so they compete and kind of in the same. So the very what, can, what can I say to them? Please give what trade That's what I did say. I think that's right. I think what you need to do is when you go into a research program like this, you make sure that you do a gut check as you go in. That you understand the unconditional risks that you're taking. 
Uh, you might have your department chairs and deans telling you, we really need more research on emerging markets, so do it, okay? And you're saying, but, 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 but. So now you have the data you can use to say, here's a reason why I don't want to do it. But there's obviously something about people like us that do research in this area that compels us. We obviously believe it's important. Okay, it's obviously important that it supersedes all of the criteria for tenure and promotion and all those things that are important for life. Um, it must be that something compels. I, I, uh, I have a story. I won't tell the story. <laughs> when I was in grad school a million years ago, I, I remember once uttering the words international finance as a topic area. Uh, and um, I, think, I think about half a dozen people fell out of their chairs uh, laughing. At, uh, at the idea. Uh, and of course, I did a thesis. My dissertation was on option pricing. Uh, and you can see how long that sustained. Once I became a, you know, I started doing the international as soon as I had my, my chance. I understood those odds as a young person way back when. I don't think things have changed that much now. There are challenges. But I'd like you to think that, um, okay, so here's, here's something I can say to you. Uh, it's Lucy. Uh, I am here. I'm here talking about this. I happen to be involved with one of the oh, journals, I and, I, and I care about it. All I can say is I care about it. And you might be sitting there saying, well, what are you doing about it, buddy? <laughs> and I'm sitting there saying, well, OK. Uh, I'm trying to do stuff. I'm trying to do stuff. Uh, obviously, I'm partial. People, I think, know I'm partial to this kind of research. Obviously, it has to meet the standards. But one of the things that our journal is doing is going after papers that are like this. We sponsored conferences. Like, uh, if you've seen, uh, for the past three years, we sponsored conferences on emerging and financial markets. Uh, China and beyond, jointly with uh, my buddies, Wei Zhang and Jay Liu, uh, and now uh, Wei, uh, Wei Zhang. Uh, we've been doing this in China, doing it in New York. Uh, so we're trying to stoke it. So there are, we're creating more outlets. That sounded very defensive. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Other comments, please. Um, I want to echo uh, you know, one of your two takeaway points that the most important thing for this research, just like any other research, is the fundamental question of uh, whether you can find the hook. And I want to the add compelling that, question. The compelling the question. The compelling question <laughs> for those people. Uh, but I, I also want to add uh, by saying that the important question. Uh, also involves over time that we the, the standard actually goes uh, higher and higher. So I want to use my paper as an example. Uh -oh. so <laughs> my paper, right, you, you, yes. you, you use it. The trusted loans. Yes. And you I'm heard China, what I said. Okay. China shadow banking. Yep. So uh, we, just like other papers uh, about shadow banking, we show that shadow banking is about regulatory uh, arbitrage. But we say that's not unique anymore, so we want to go deeper by asking the question, the now more compelling question, is regulatory arbitrage good or bad? Yeah. 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 So we try to also address that question by showing what is the fundamental investments uh, those, those transactions are funding, therefore can answer the question, um, you know, whether it adds to the systemic risk of the uh, uh, economy or it um, enriches the uh, financial system. And we also show whether the, uh, the operation, the, the, the pricing is efficient for these transactions. Very good. So let me say that. So I said the most compelling thing was the fact that you're broadening the base, right? The expanding the market capacity. Right. That's true, but it belies that. It's much more than that. It's, it's about the fact that you're, bringing, you're focusing on this big question of regulatory. How regulations affect financial prices and corporate financial policies is something that we've been working on for 50 years. And it's obviously compelling and interesting to us. And so, yeah. So I congratulate you for following this line of research. It's great. Anybody else? Oh, no, no, no. You've had too much time. <laughs> you've had too much time. Anybody else? Anybody else? OK. Should we let you? No, please. Go ahead. Please. What a great question. Um, I have no idea as to whether or not that's true. How would I do, how would I find out if scholars have disproportionately emphasized corporate governance over legal restrictions? That's what you're asking. In the study of emerging markets. Is that what you're asking? I think and is it right? 
And how do we know if that's right or wrong? I don't know. I was reading on the plane uh, over yesterday, I was reading the chapter three of the, uh, uh, the Global Financial Stability Report of the IMF that just came out this month. And it's all about corporate governance in emerging markets. Your papers might be cited in there, go find them. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking after I read through these 40 pages that I'm sitting there going, this is a lot of attention on corporate governance in emerging markets. And there's a lot of other things, and I knew I was coming here today this morning. There's a lot of other things in emerging markets that are interesting as well. And it's interesting how little they feature of that. Or maybe they think of this corporate governance as an all-encompassing topic in their minds, and that's what they're showcasing. But it was really kind of, it was a little bit skewed, and that's what I think is behind your question, which is a very good question. I, I don't know how to think about that. Um, maybe redressing what would appear to be skewed is an opportunity for a young scholar. If there's a relatively understudied dimension in emerging markets, maybe that's an opportunity for you going forward compared to another paper on governance. I don't know. <coughs> One more comment. I think we're, uh, we've got about one minute left, so please. Yeah. I've talked about the challenges of doing energy market research, but I think there's one merit to it. Uh, because I two. Think uh, two now. I said the citation <coughs> premium. Yes. Now yeah. you're going to give me a second one. Go. Well, there's, this, uh, there's uh, definitely less of a competition compared to doing U.S. Okay. Except look how big this room is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I brought my book. I brought an extra copy of my book. And I said to myself, I was going to give this copy to the best question that comes after, afterwards. And there were many very good ones. First of all, let me say thank you very much for coming. I thoroughly enjoyed talking about this stuff. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, to this lady, I don't know your name. Can you come up and, uh, and give you this? Okay. <laughs> thank you very much.